Welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nottermaker with our guest Dave Thomas from Lock in Your Success and Tim Pearson who uh, does mentoring with us. Uh, before we get going, quick disclosure, the Capital Discussions is not a broker dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. If you don't know your situation, and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss of trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. Again, this is for educational purposes only. If you want to read the whole thing, just pause the video or look at the bottom of any of our web pages. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, Tim or Dave, you guys want to take over with the screen share? Sure. Um, I guess I just hit the little thing where it says share screen, Tom. Yeah, and then you pick uh, which monitor, if you've got multiple monitors, and it should be pretty easy. Okay. And while you're doing that, just uh, I know it's been a long time since you've been on, so welcome back, Dave. Uh, for those who don't know Dave, he uh, works with John Locke uh, doing M3 kind of stuff, and we're uh, happy to have you here. Uh, I've known Dave a long time, back in another venue, like, like many <laughs> of us. Yeah, that's probably about almost 10 years ago. Oh, hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, I see your screen. Okay, you see, uh, is it uh, the Capital Discussions 12 2017? That's the one? It is, yep. Wow, fantastic. And I assume, Tim, you can see it as well? I got it. It's fine. Great, great. So, uh, Tom, I think that the, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. I'm glad to, um, I know we, uh, we're trying to get on here, and I guess the um, uh, I apologize up in advance that we didn't have uh, uh, a great thing to put as topics up for you to put out to people, Tom, because I know we kind of had a, a TBD uh, a topic discussion for today. Right. So, uh, uh, and I think that the uh, Tim and I, uh, you know, we were uh, we were just talking just before going live here. We we're saying about you know geography and about you know where you are local to people and. Uh, Tom, you're saying about changes, maybe where you're going to be living and stuff like that. And I know that's, you know, even from a trading perspective, it's always kind of nice to, um, you know, my family is all still here in the state of Washington, uh, my three kids, and two of which are full-time traders. So um, it's very, very nice to be able to get together, even though we do a lot by, you know, web sharing and stuff like that, even though because we're, you know, but we're all within about a half hour of each other. So it's, uh, it makes it very convenient. But, uh, but speaking of that, as far as Tim and I, we only live about 15 minutes away from each other uh, by car. And so we, it's, uh, we've known each other for, I guess, I don't know how long, how long, Tim, probably, I don't know, seven or eight years. Seven or eight years, I think. Yep. And, uh, you know, we've gone through various stages of trading uh, and, and uh, I guess, um, you know, we've been friends for that long and we've, we, we have a, we kind of have a, um, a uh, you know, kind of a set in stone, you know, we get together at least probably at least, a, you know, a couple times a week to go have a cup of coffee at our uh, usual Starbucks. Um, and a lot of it is just to, you know, we, you know, we talk about all kinds of stuff, but a lot of it is centered around trading. And, you know, what we're doing because both, you know, both Tim and I do, um, uh, you know, mentoring. And so we're always chatting about that and just, you know, different uh, opportunities and challenges that we have in that area just to be able to kind of, you know, share, you know, best practices and things like that, which is, I think, very uh, something that I did in the corporate world for many years as far as, um, you know, best practices and trying to promote those around the world. So I guess the, this is just kind of, continuing on with that and so to that point tim and i um you know got together and we're we're you know we got we've been on here or at least i've been on here with uh myself alone and i think probably in combination with john locke over the past few years talking about you know some of the typical some of the you know uh strategies that have been out there for quite some time like m3 and things like that and i know tim you've been on here talking about various things like road trip and various things so we just thought it might be a kind of a neat thing to maybe talk about some other things. Uh, and being that we're here almost at Christmas time, um, you know, we thought of, you know, things that we were, you know, we, we kind of looked at what we were talking about when we were sitting around having coffee. And, you know, some of it was like, well, gee, have you, have you done your trading plan for 2018? Uh, is there any special things that you're thinking about doing before the end of the year? Uh, and, oh, by the way, how, how are things 
been doing this year. And so we, we just said, well, you know, maybe these might be some good topics. So, Tom, I hope you agree. <laughs> yeah, it looks uh, good to me. Those are all good subjects. Yeah, I have no idea. Uh, and I would say is that during the process this morning or over the next, you know, hour, I guess, that we'll be together, um, if people have questions and various things, Tom, I would say interrupt, uh, you know, when appropriate. Uh, uh, it's not like we've, we're, we're going to be running through any, you know, long trades and stuff. It's going to be more of a, you know, kind of a round table, more of a discussion. So I would sure. say if, um, you know, if you've got people that have questions or, you know, if they, you know, I don't know how you do that. If they come on or they just ask questions, you know, what, whatever is how you do it is fine with me. Um, you know, well, there's can, a, there's we, a chat. So just, if they have questions, just put it in the chat. And if you want to come on and talk, let me know and I can promote people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, so anyway, so we thought, you know, some of these topics might be kind of fun to kind of go over. And I think it, you know, one of the things that Tim and I have seen over the years is, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, Tim, what was it? I don't know, maybe what, three years ago, maybe three, four years ago, I guess maybe we were having a discussion. And I was like, and I said, Hey, Tim, you know, I just kind of finished up my trading plan for next year. I said, you know, how's, um, you know, maybe we could kind of share and kind of look at each other's and see how it's going. And it was like, yeah, you know, that's something I need to do. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, I've been doing all this trading and it was like, you know, we, we kind of get in the habit of just doing and as opposed to actually planning. And uh, so we ended up, you know, just kind of sharing with each other kind of what we were doing. And I think, um, I don't know, Tim, did you, did you end up having um, a little something that you could actually show to people today? Or I'm not sure if, uh, uh, I'm not if sure. that's available or. Yeah, I'm not sure that I do. I'm looking right now and I, um, <laughs> I don't think I do. <clears throat> we might have to talk about it. Just, just to talk about it. Okay. Um, uh, maybe Tim, when we were talking about that, what were some of the things that you were thinking about back then when we were initially talking about the trading plan? Well, yeah, uh, your trading plan should include, um, it's basically a way to plan how big you should be trading and how much capital you allocate to each strategy and, uh, uh, what your expected income is based on expected results, you know, and, it's very important that your trading plan be something specific enough to say, uh, I'm only going to use, let's say 50,000 in capital on my options trading because a lot of people say, well, I don't need to control my margin because I have a, I have a lot of money. I can just use a lot of margin. But what happens is you'll, you'll have a trade where you expect to make, let's say a thousand dollars from, and you'll let the margin grow and grow and grow and you'll use 200,000 in margin for it. Well, that's a terrible risk reward ratio. In fact, it's so terrible that uh, you probably shouldn't even be doing it. You know, if you're going to use that much margin to only make a thousand. So you do need to plan your margin. And um, <clears throat> based on that, um, you can take uh, average long-term expected returns and Bottom line for almost all option strategies that we do, two to three percent a month is an average reasonable return. I mean, I don't care what you're doing, you know, and some guys say I get 15 percent and they do, but they might lose 10 percent the next month. I mean, on average, over a long period of time, almost every strategy we do comes out somewhere around three percent a month. You know, so you can say, well, if I'm going to spend 50,000 in capital, 3% of that is $1,500. Therefore, I can reasonably expect to make about $1,500 a month. And your trading plan should have some way of calculating all this and showing you um, how you can set realistic goals. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that I had looked at as far as, um, um, you know, Tim, I thought you made a great point as far as, you know, when you're about looking at your capital, because one of the things that I'd found even with some uh, students as I was going along with some trades is that, you know, they kept on making these adjustments and I was like, are you checking your capital level? And just because some people might say, well, you know, some people trade, <clears throat> uh, you know, ac their account and they trade a hundred percent of the money in their account. Um, other people will have so much headroom, so to speak in the account where, you know, they'll never, uh, they'll never have any issues because they get so much money in their account and they're only trading a small portion of it. One of the things that's critical is as you're going through these trades is, as Tim, you were just pointing out, is, you know, keeping an eye on your risk because, 
you know, you may think you're just making adjustments along the way, but uh, are you, you know, if something really bad happened and you thought you only had fifty thousand dollars to trade, and all of a sudden you find out that this is really a, you know, hundred thousand dollar trade that you've got at risk, um, without even looking at it, you know, you you actually have to, you know, be very aware of that. Um, because the thing that I've seen, at least over the years, is you know we're we're basically just risk managers. You know we're 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 putting money at risk to try to make some money, and we're just constantly. I I usually never look at how much money I'm going to be making. I'm usually looking at uh, how to how to you know assess my risk to make sure that I don't lose because uh, or lose too much. And usually that's always the market is usually going to tell me basically what they're going to give me at the end of a trade. You know, I never can predict that. I think Tim, you make a good point on average. I think you're absolutely right. I, I think, you know, on average, those are, you know, kind of expected returns that we've seen over the years, but usually going in a trade, it seems like I spend way more time trying to figure out how to manage my risk and to make sure that I don't, go beyond certain levels of either max loss or close to that, or um, as opposed to saying, okay, well, how do I manage my risk to make more money in the trade? It's, it seems like it's always kind of the opposite. Is that kind of your thinking too, Tim, or? Oh, absolutely. Um, Yeah, we are risk managers. And if we make some money along the way, (laughs) you know, that's great. Um, But I do have a, but we, we know we're not in control of what we make, but we're trying to be in control of what we lose. Right. But, but I do have a um, target income level per month, you might say, you know, and, and that's my goal. And so I'm trying to size my accounts and my trades so that I can reach that goal uh, with uh, known capital, you know, so that everything doesn't get out of whack. But whether I make it or not, that's different. You know, that's, that's whatever the market does for me. That's true. And I think, you know, what, what I usually do, you know, with looking at my trading plan is that there's always a, um, and I don't know, and I'm not making suggestions that this is what you should do, but this is just telling you what I do. Um, you know, I usually, you know, just from a family perspective, I usually, you know, you know put together some sort of a, um, you know, I, I record all my stuff in uh, Quicken, you know, the little software for your kind of checking account and all your different things. And, you know, that way I know kind of what's going out the door and what's coming in. And because I don't have any other job, this is my job, which is trading. Um, I don't have to worry about a lot of other different sources of income because it's, it's uh, pretty, uh, you know, one dimensional, Um, you know, and, and primarily it's trading, you know, a small amount of teaching, but primarily it's trading. And so I set up a, a budget for, you know, our family and, you know, literally it's taking, that's kind of where it all starts as uh, saying, okay, well, here's what we're projecting for next year. And here's what we, you know, think, you know, how much money we need for, you know, our mortgage and food and, you know, uh, you know, uh, vacation or gifts or, you know, what, whatever the case may be and saying, okay, it's a process of, of going through that. And this is kind of how I got into the trading plan because it was, okay, here's how we did to the budget. And now if we need, you know, whatever the amount is per month over the course of the year, if it's, you know, a thousand dollars a month or 10,000 or 20,000, you know, that's all individual, your individual situation. But ultimately whatever you come up with, you have to be able to go there. And like Tim said, uh, you're saying, okay, if I need to make X amount per month or X amount per year, uh, how much capital do I have and what is my expected return? And does that even make sense? Um, because if you're, you know, I've seen many students come by where they're like saying, okay, well, I need to make, I want to get out of my job and I want to be able to trade and I want to do this, you know, within three months or three years, or maybe it's five years. And sometimes I find that people have a very kind of a, they don't have a, a good perspective about how much, you know, work it takes to actually go through this calculation and be able to figure out, okay, is this a reasonable thing? Can I really do this? And so once you've done that and you're actually, um, you can actually say that, okay, I've got my budget and let's say, let's take an example. Let's say it's like, uh, say it's $5,000 a month or $60,000 per year that that's what you want to make. 
And it's like, okay, do I have the, uh, do I have the capital? And I'm not saying capital, just capital in the, you know, we, you know, Tim and I talk about this all the time. It's like, okay, how much capital trading capital do you really have as compared to your net portfolio? Because a lot of people will have, you know, they'll have 401ks, they'll have, um, you know, retirement accounts, they'll have maybe, maybe annuities and they've got, you know, bonds and stocks and, you know, all different kinds of things. Or, you know, maybe you have people might just have cash. You know, it's, it's, you never know. I mean, people are all over the place. Uh, but more typically, you probably got people with kind of like, you know, that have been working for a company, they'll probably have some 401ks or IRAs. Uh, and you've got to be able to figure out what portion of that you should be trading. And I know uh, John Locke and I have had this discussion quite a few times, and John's talked about this and, you know, various seminars that he's done. And, you know, people just starting off, you know, he doesn't like to see people, you know, using any more than probably about, uh, you know, 10 or 20% of their net portfolio. Um, because if, you know, something, you know, if something happens catastrophic, uh, as I always say, you know, we don't want to be, you know, you know, finding ourselves the next day living under, you know, living under the bridge. Um, you know, you've got to be able to recover. And so uh, that sometimes really wakes people up because when they say, well, wait a minute, if I can only, I can only, have my, you know, 50,000, if they might have a half a million dollars sitting in all their accounts and they say, well, 10%, that's only 50,000. Well, 50,000 times, you know, 3%, that's $1,500 a month. Well, I'm not even coming close to the 5,000 that I need. You know, I might need, you know, a lot more than that to be able to accomplish that. So that kind of opens people's eyes very quickly as to setting expectations of what they're trying to get out of this. Now, obviously, some people might, you know, some people come to me, they have, you know, huge accounts, and it's not an issue. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, um, it may be very uh, conservative as far as looking at it. But I know that, you know, the last thing that we want to have anybody do is, you know, why do people start options and stop? Usually they, you know, they'll blow up their account. They'll be trading something and, you know, all of a sudden they, you know, they don't have any nest egg. They don't have any safety net of, of cash reserves. Um, I know when I went into trading, you know, many years ago, you know, I guess Tom and I were saying maybe it's close to 10 years ago. The, um, you know, I made sure that I know that it was going to take me some amount of years to be able to, you know, understand this, learn options and get it to the point where it was actually providing a, a yearly income, even though, Options is not steady. It's it's up and down. As Tim, I think you would agree. <laughs> you know, year year to year, you never know quite what you're going to make. And it's kind of like you know, people working in real estate or in sales. You know, like working on commissions. You you, you really never know. So you have to have some sort of a, you know, you got to have a you know a safety net out there that because uh, if you have to use the money that you're making month to month in the trades. That's a really, really tough thing to do because you'll start end up making decisions on your trading that are not in sync with what your 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 trading guidelines are or rules. Because it's like you're saying, well, do I make this adjustment to a trade or do I go have do I go to the doctor? Um, you know, it really, I mean, it can get that tight with money. So you know, you should never be uh, you know never have a put yourself in that kind of a position. Well, what yeah. what do you think, Tim, on that? Oh, I agree. And, um, you know, people get tempted. I see this all the time too. Well, it's, it's someone will come to me and talk and say, but I have all the money. So I'm just going to make more and trade more. But you, you know, one rule that I won't break personally is, um, using more than about 25% of my liquid net worth for right. trading. Okay. And I want to make more money, of course. And I could, I could use 30% of my liquid net worth, but I won't do it. You've got to have that buffer there. And that's just good planning. Um, and then of that 20% that you use for options trading, that's the size of your options account. At any one time, you only use maybe up to 80% of that in positions because you need some money left over if you have to make adjustments or do something or have a drawdown. Or, or be able to get in and, you know, especially when you're trying to exit a trade and sometimes the, you know, your positions might be a little bit wonky as far as what you're doing with options and, 
sometimes the brokerage will bump up your margin just temporarily. Yeah. So maybe Dave, uh, let's see if anybody has any questions or maybe we can go on to um, uh, the next thing. Another, uh, another thing so we can get through all these. <laughs> yeah. Tom, Tom, did you have any input on any of that or? Uh, I know you were talking about losses. I had an optionetics class years ago and George Fontenelle said the first question he asked anybody that came up to him with a new trading system is how much can I lose? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the focus on keeping the losses small. Um, if you let the losses get away, that really destroys your, uh, your performance. So um, we try and yeah. focus on that on the money we're trading too. We want to keep that equity growth constant and I'd rather take small profits and, and take less risk and try and get bigger returns, but, uh, you know, have bigger drawdowns. Yeah. Cause sometimes it could take, I mean, literally it could take years to come back. Oh, sure. uh, you know, depending upon, you know, especially if you're, you're trying to make a thousand, you're trying to make a thousand dollars, uh, and you, and you trade and all of a sudden and your max loss is a thousand and all of a sudden a, a trade comes by and you know, you're down 5,000. Um, and it's like, you know, those are, it's kind of, it's kind of tough. And unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, during those, you know, nine or 10 years that I've been trading, you know, we have, I know I do, I've got scars on my backside to, because, you know, those things have happened. And so I, I don't talk about this stuff just because it's theory. It's actual, you know, I've, I've got the proof. <laughs> yeah, me too. I remember. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, you know, we, we, we use these, you know, especially, you know, hence the name capital discussions, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about our capital and, right. and, you know, it's the, the reality is, is, you know, you know, we've, we've, as a group, we've, we've all had to learn our lessons and, you know, and I don't care how much people that I have heard in the past. I remember, you know, gosh, what was it? Nine years ago when I was being mentored by Dan Harvey, um, you know, some of those thoughts and some of the things that we're talking about today are just as important as they were nine years ago. Uh, but sometimes you listen and you hear it, but you know what? You don't really quite act on it until sometimes it, it happens to you. Sounds and like my kids. Yeah. It's, you know, well, we all are, right? Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, you know, for the same reason why, you know, we try to help our kids down the road and try to help them. Well, you know, it, it's sometimes it's, uh, you know, sometimes lessons are only learned and, you know, that you just hope that they're just not too, uh, you know, too devastating uh, because many times, you know, people have to learn by themselves. So, hey, I wonder if uh, we can go on to the last one, because I, I love talking about how you decide to go full-time, and people are really interested in how can I be a full-time trader. Yeah, so, sure. That sounds good. So, I don't know, Dave, do you, uh, how did you decide, uh, or how did you make the decision to become a full-time trader? How'd that go? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, everybody has probably different perspectives on this, but the, uh, I think there was a, uh, I had been working in the kind of the high tech world for, for many years and, um, you know, ventured into, uh, or getting out of that and, um, you know, into, uh, the, uh, the, the world of, uh, uh, wine, uh, which was a, a fun thing to go into and, you know, became a sommelier and all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, as kind of a, just a, a fun thing to do as a hobby. Uh, but actually the, the thing that really, pushed me more into, uh, into full-time trading was, uh, right about the time my, uh, my, my dad actually, uh, passed away. And this was back in 2006. And I know one of the things that he and I always talked about was, you know, when he went into retirement mode, you know, he didn't really go and do a lot. And, um, you know, it was one of those lessons where, you know, he says, Hey, you know, when you go into, you know, approaching, you know, retirement age, retirement age and stuff like that, you know, make sure that you have something that you'll, you know, I wanted to be able to have something that was going to keep my brain active and something where I was able to, um, since I worked in high tech companies, they don't tend to give out uh, pensions. Um, so I needed to be able to have something to be able to set me up for retirement mode. And also probably just as important, I wanted to have something that would keep my head and my brain active. 
uh, and something that I could do, not be tied down to a particular location. Um, so I had no idea what I should do, but it was actually a friend of mine, uh, a neighbor of mine who's uh, still trading um, and is an active trader. Um, he gave me, uh, he, you know, he says, Hey Dave, he says, uh, I've been doing some reading on this stuff about trading options. <laughs> and he, and he put about 25 books on my, on my doorstep at my house one day. And he says, you know, here you go. So I literally started reading and, uh, uh, and it was literally after I got through that, I actually ended up probably soon thereafter, probably chatting with Tom Nunemaker. <laughs> Yeah, I know that guy. And so, you know, it was like, gosh, I mean, this was like, I remember it was the summer of summer of 2008. So I guess a little bit less than 10 years ago. And uh, I remember it was kind of like, well, wait, I'm calling this guy and he's in Germany. It's like, <laughs> where, what am I getting into here? You know, <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm the poster child for being a trader and living wherever you want. Right. Exactly. So it was, uh, and, you know, hence with my, with my last name being Thomas, I, I was always a bit of a doubting Thomas as far as this whole thing. And, you know, when, uh, you know, trying to, you know, at that time, listening to a lot of different, you know, webinars of people doing trading and stuff like that, you're trying to figure out, is this real? You know, is this, you know, and I was really trying to find out, you know, is this, is it true that you could maybe earn this kind of money or, you know, what does this involve and all this kind of stuff? It looks kind of fun. It looks kind of interesting. And, um, you know, as being a, you know, a former engineer and stuff like that and working in, you know, manufacturing and for many, many years with high tech companies, it was like, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And, you know, one thing led to another. And like I said, soon thereafter, about six months later, I was doing mentoring with, with Dan Harvey and, and then eventually with John Locke and, you know, and here we are. So, um, but the, the big thing about going full-time into trading was, you know, there was a need for income and that's probably, you know, one of the, the biggest things was, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't set up for retirement. I wasn't set up for, you know, having uh, companies that I'd worked for that offered pensions. So it was like, well, I still got a ways to go before social security. So it's like, I need to, and I want to keep myself busy and keep my brain active. And so um, I just kept on pursuing it. And to me, it was like going back to college. Um, and so it was, you know, for all these years, it was basically like, you know, getting a, another undergraduate degree and another graduate degree, except in this case, it was with options. And, you know, I think the probably one of the best things that's happened since then is probably about three years ago when John Locke came to me and said, Hey, you know, I'm getting really busy with, you know, mentoring people. Uh, could, do you have time to maybe help me, help me out? And, and that's just been just way too much fun. Um, I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity and the, just the, the joy of being able to chat with uh, uh, quite a few people over the course of the last three years and hopefully um, you know, been able to try to, you know, make a difference in their lives by sharing the, you know, the, uh, you know, the process that I've gone through and becoming a full-time trader, uh, even to the extent where, like I said, my two of my kids and actually my, uh, the third, uh, her, her husband also, I taught as far as trading and, um, and, uh, he's got a, a full-time job, but he does it on the side. But the other two are doing it, you know, full time. Well, actually, my son's got a full time job as well, but he does it. He's got like kind of two full time jobs. Uh, so, you know, that has kept me very, very active in being able to uh, do trading. And, you know, it really makes a big difference. I think, um, you know, as we all get older, uh, it's nice to be able to have something to be able to uh, keep your brain active and to keep sharp. Um and that certainly is the case because, you know, a lot of people come on and they've got great questions and they challenge us. Um, and that's uh, even with Tim and I, when we get together, like we're saying for coffee, I mean, I mean, yeah, we'll talk trading, but it's just, you know, we'll challenge each other. Uh, I mean, there's no question. And, you know, we'll ask each other tough questions and, you know, hold each other accountable for stuff. And because, you know, we take it seriously and, you know, this isn't, we're not trying to make money to just go on a holiday. You know, we're not trying to make money just to make a little bit of extra. Not that that's not that there's anything wrong with that. And if you're set up to do that and you just still want to do trading, that's great. But 
uh, it's it, when we're doing full time trading, it's a business. It's our job, and we take it very, very seriously. And I think because of that, um, you know, we try to be able to share some of those uh, thoughts with people because I think it's a, uh, um, uh, it's it's a it's a good thing. I think it's a, uh, you know, from a freedom perspective, I think it provides people the opportunity for freedom of maybe not sitting in a cubicle and being able to, you know, do things from, I mean, look at Tom, he was in Germany, now Portugal, and here we are in, you know, the West Coast of the USA. And, uh, you know, I've mentored people literally all around the world. I mean, pretty much all over, you know, you know, down under and, you know, <laughs> all the continents, you know, whether it be, you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, Australia and Europe and uh, Brazil and, you know, all over the place. So, you know, people join from all over. It's a, it's a pretty flat environment when it comes to trading because as long as you get on the internet and you, I guess wherever you are, if you can, you get a broker, uh, you can do it. So, um, I don't know, Tim, how about, how about yourself? Yeah, well, um, I had all the same things. I've always been interested in options since 1987 and uh, did some trading, but I really got serious about it in 2008, I guess, and uh, did the mentoring in 2009 and um, always thought it'd be cool to be a full-time trader, but um, I, I want to share a slide and show you um, uh, what made the final decision for me. If I can share my screen, let's see here. Can I do that? Let me stop sharing on mine. Yeah, that's usually better. There we go. I got it. Okay. Let me, uh, maybe some people have seen this slide, but. Um, oh, this is your famous chart, Tim. This is my famous chart. This is known around the world. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it is. So maybe this is old, but <coughs> I, I trade, I track, uh, by the way, when we're talking about business, uh, you have to track every trade. You have to know everything that you've ever done and how you're doing so you can measure if you're getting better or, or worse or if it's working at all and I have a little spreadsheet that I uh, one of the things it does is makes this chart for me and this is going back to 2009 when I started my mentoring um, and I went to my mentoring and I got done about maybe November or so about here somewhere and then I traded on my own and look at look what happened I had some winners some losers big loser you know some basically nothing um, all across the board, in and out, up and down, um, and it was it was just not consistent. But um, when I saw that uh, in uh, about October, September, October 2012, when I saw this kind of chart, that uh, something happened here, and suddenly I had no losers, and I had a generally increasing trend line. If you average that out, it'd be increasing. And after a year of that. I said, okay, now I'm, I'm consistent enough, I'm good enough at this that I can quit the job and be a full-time trader. And that's exactly what I did in about um, October 2012 and never looked back. It's been great. So the question is, what happened? What did I do or what happened here that made the big difference from this kind of profile to this kind of profile? And there's two things that happened. You probably stopped trading iron condors. <laughs> um, you know what? That's actually true. Um, although I did, I did trade Iron Connors for a while, and uh, I, even after this, but not not as a big deal. Hey Tim, but, wasn't that the day that I introduced you to coffee? Wasn't that the time? <laughs> yeah, I started going to Starbucks. That's what happened. <laughs> um, well, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but that's not what I was going to say. But anyway. Um, yeah, I met Dave. That's what happened. No, um, that's true, too. That's about when I got to know Dave. But um, this is when I quit trying to trade every strategy that came across the board. You know, uh, prior to this, someone would come and say, I'm doing the XYZ strategy and I've got 22% uh, results and it's great. And so I, I felt like if I'm going to be this great options trader, I should be able to do anything that comes along. So I'm going to do it. And I'd win a few and I'd lose a few and that's, then I'd quit doing it. And the next one would come along and it's a, you know, maybe it's a butterfly instead of iron condor, but um, it's weekly or something. And I tried that. And anyway, um, what happened here is I quit all that and I focused on one or maybe two strategies from that point forward. And I say focus because I did some other stuff, but 95% or more of my trading was one or two things and M3 was one of them. Right here is when I started doing the M3 and it made a big difference right away. Um, 
the other thing that happened here was I quit trying every vehicle out there. You know, I was doing maybe 30 different stocks. I was doing Russell, I was doing SPX, I was doing NDX. And I quit all that and I focused on just the Russell and the SPX from this point forward. And uh, that made a huge difference. And I know this is one of our other topics, but um, you know, the question is why do, why do most uh, full-time traders focus on one strategy? Partly this is why, because you just can't do everything. Anyway, that's yeah. my point on yeah, this. I think, yeah, I think, I think one of the, just to your last point, Tim, I think one of the things that, uh, and maybe it's kind of transitioning to the, you know, why do we all converge into one strategy after a while? I think even in my, uh, from my perspective, same with you, Tim, I was trying in the same time frame. you know, our, our charts don't, are not that dissimilar from each other. And it was like, let's try all these different things and all these different stocks and, you know, all these various things. And it's like, you know, it just took up and it takes up a, such a, a large amount of your time and bandwidth that I know at the end of one year, I was like, I was doing a couple of these trades and they were doing very well. And I was doing all this stuff that wasn't doing well. And I sat down with my wife and she was like, well, why the heck are you doing all that other stuff? And it was very clear, it, you know, and it was like, but I was so deep into it that it was like, well, I got to keep doing all of this stuff. And it was like, no, you don't just concentrate on the stuff that's working. You know, <laughs> all that other stuff is just taking up your time and your, you know, and the brain cells to, to do all that stuff. So it's like, don't even, don't even bother with that. So well, um, what happened here also is I, I, I had much less work to do. That's exactly right. Exactly. And, and one of the other things is that I think that one of the key learning points that I learned over the years was when you think when you've got lots of trades on and everything is going well with the market and you're going along and they're just making money and you're just feeling like this is like the best thing since, you know, whatever. And you think you could do an unlimited amount of trades because it's just like, you know, ringing up the cash register. Well, all of a sudden when you find out very quickly when the market turns or just something happens and it could be literally in a, in a, just a, a moment where all of a sudden you start to see, you know, the red uh, happening very quickly. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10, 20, 30 trades on and they're all losing money quickly and the market's diving, let's say. And, and you're sitting there saying, you know, it's, I, I, I use the example of that's kind of like going into an emergency room into like triage. And it's like, okay, what trade is bleeding the most? And the tough thing with that is that you, you attend to one, but guess what? Now all the other ones keep bleeding. And, and you're trying to make trades. You're trying to adjust. You're trying to do things to try to stop the bleeding. And guess what? You can't handle all 30 at a time. It's just impossible, you know, it's just like, we, we just don't have the bandwidth to do it. So it's only when those situations occur and hopefully that happens to you and you don't have a devastating result because that is one of the single biggest things that happened to me where, you know, I, I didn't have a devastating result, but I, I could see in a very small mode of where you had too many trades on and I was like, okay, I, under I, I understand, I get it, I now see it. And even though, you know, people would say, well, hey, come on, you're not really diversified. And no, you're not this. And you know, you're not that. To me, it was, you have to be, you know, as your capital level increases over the years, hopefully with, you know, with, with success, your capital level increases. I, I, I trade, you know, basically two trades a month and that's it. And so it's not a, you know, I try to really limit the amount uh, of, of trades that I do because if something is going wrong, uh, I need to be able to attend to it. And it's, it's also, you know, the, from the perspective of, you know, I hate to say it, but it's like, you know, I was doing a situation with M3 where I was having like the current month on and then the next month. So I had two trades on at the same time. I couldn't understand when, and I, I talked to Tim about this one time. I was like, you know, I don't understand. I'm having a real hard time sleeping. And it's like, you know, what's going on? And I was like, you know, I was perplexed. I couldn't figure it out. And then all of a sudden, you know, one of my trades went off uh, and, you know, it was it completed. And so I just had one trade on and all of a sudden 
I was sleeping fine. And it was like, well, that's kind of odd. But it was like something, you know, there was, I was thinking about it probably, you know, unconsciously thinking about, oh gosh, if the market does this, uh, what am I going to do? It was again, getting into the mentality of having too many trades on. And uh, so it is something that's, it's real. And, you know, a lot of people, especially new folks, you know, getting introduced to options, you know, they're looking at, you know, all the characteristics, all the, you know, the, the rules, the, the guidelines, the, the mechanics of like, okay, how do you adjust? Well, what strike do you do and how much and where and all this kind of stuff. And well, eventually you get beyond that and you learn that, but then it gets into more issues where, you know, it, it's like all of a sudden if you see your, your profits kind of plateauing, it's time to address all the soft issues, as I would say, you know, the hard issues, you know, we used to say this in the manufacturing world where you got, you know, kind of hardware and software. Okay. You, you got the hardware all set now. Now it's the soft issues. And it's like those soft things where are more psychological, you know, and John Locke talks about this in a lot of his seminars that he does uh, not to plug the stuff for John here, but it, but it's true. I've seen that over the years. And I think Tim, you would agree there's a lot of, you know, the psychology aspects of all this stuff really comes into play, you know, big time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, do we have, I don't know if I can see the chat. I think something popped up. Let's see here. It hey, looks like uh, Anthony Benacasa. There's a name from the past. Hey, hey Tony, how's it going? <clears throat> uh, I think uh, Anthony works with Seth. I think they were, maybe sharing an office at one time maybe they still do but uh, he had a nice uh, comment uh, probably easier to read it than read the whole thing out yeah i don't know if i can get it up on the screen here let's see how come i can't okay something you guys see in my screen or what happened i don't know what happened here uh, yeah i can see it there we go let me get this out of the way think or swim okay oh we've had some stuff okay <laughs> let me back up and we'll come to tony and just say full-time i was laid off and had to generate income yep social security yep yep keeping your mind active that's good for that <laughs> basic math nothing complicated no square roots and stuff but you have to be able to add and subtract and uh that's enough exercise for me so tim you we, we're seeing your think of swim screen is that correct yeah and the oh, chat okay. chat i don't see the chat i just see your think of swim screen Oh, I thought we were seeing the chat. That's why I was wondering if you had. Uh, I don't know how to make it show the chat. Maybe it uh, hides it because everybody can see it on their own. Okay. Well, um, oh, now I made it go away. Let's see. A uh, question from Jonathan Thomas. Have Dave or Tim had any other investing experience? Can they briefly touch on options trading has been more or less successful than their other investing ventures? Well, that's a long and complicated question, but um, I do. Um, I started trading stocks in uh, 1976, maybe, 77. Uh, physio control was the first one I ever did. Uh, and you had to go to the brokers and put your, you had to write a paper order ticket, put one of those pneumatic tubes and it went downstairs to the desk and they filled the trade from there anyway. Another one was uh, Ohio Edison. That's what's called was was called, um, and I still own that one. I've let it compound for thirty years or more, and that's that's turned out well. Anyway, I I have, um, but I was working full time at the time, and so it was much more passive. Um, and I did a lot of mutual funds and uh, a lot of investing. I guess that's where my capital came from. You know, um, more or less successful. Hard to say, hard to answer that question because it's different. Um, in the 90s, we had the bull run and I benefited from that through those mutual funds. But my options are, I would say, um, more neutral and allows me to keep 80% of my net worth in cash, which is not exposed to the market. Uh, so it's more successful in, in respect that you can make your decent income with much less capital at risk. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. That's a tough question. Uh, which question, Tim? 
uh, from where Jonathan says, have we had any other investing experience and how has options trading been more or less successful than other ventures? Yeah, I guess from my own perspective on that, my investing experience prior to, you know, during the course of my, I guess, professional career um, was just, you know, very uh, hobby, hobby investing, I guess, if you would call it. Um, um, but when I actually was able to get a few, few dollars to invest, um, what I found out very quickly is that I had uh, very, very uh, limited or, you know, very up and down success with trying to guess direction on stocks. Um, to that end, that's when I ended up uh, you know, giving giving money to a professional money manager uh, that did well for a while. Uh, but then, uh, you know, you know, when 2008 came, they thought that they could handle down markets and they didn't do too well. And that's when um, I decided to uh, say, okay, well, if this is, uh, I can't have this at my age, I can't have this happen to me again. So I better um, do something where I can really actually learn and understand it better. And, and that's, you know, so, so, you know, since then, that's been a, you know, very good, you know, from a success standpoint, it's been a, a good decision. Yeah. Well, let me uh, do a couple more questions here. I didn't realize you guys can't see this, but um, Anthony says uh, a lot of things about Brett Steenberger in his blog this morning. But he says, I'm curious about the point you made and why we converge towards one strategy. I had two very good years trading the road trip, a trade that I really like a lot. But like everything, and especially in the markets, nothing lasts forever, and I'm concerned about when and if this strategy doesn't work anymore. Have you and Tim ever considered that the potential end of the edge? And have you considered utilizing or expanding the road trip or any other instruments? Not sure about that part. Well, I'll start here, uh, Anthony. Um, You know, it is a worry. Um, I guess I feel like there's slow drift in the markets and something that works now after several years or five years may not work the same. Um, and because of that, I feel like we should always be working on some new trade or some new way to do what we're doing uh, that will adapt uh, when this slow drift in how the markets work happens. And I'm not talking about a big down market or an up market. I'm talking about, um, you know, broken wing butterflies five years from now may not work like they work now because of computers, uh, market makers, anything could change all that. Um, so I do worry about that. Uh, I do try to always have something that I'm working on to develop and uh, go to if I need to, but I'll be honest, I'm not that prepared right now. <laughs> and um, question about using or expanding the road trip. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, each trade is basically a concept more than a set of rules. And if you follow the concept, then you're basically trading the road trip or the M3. And uh, I wouldn't, for example, consider changing road trip or even M3 by adding calendars for some reason. I would not consider doing that without extensive back testing and development. And that's a lot of work. And so I tend not to do it because what we have is working. Um, I tend to stay within the concept that we already have. I guess that's my answer to your question there. So Tim, I see a question from Kevin Shea here. He's saying, Dave, is your strategy to do a very, uh, a few very large trades versus the toss view of trading, uh, trading small and often. Um, is, I, I, I'm not sure um, the think or swim view of trading small and often. I think maybe is that maybe thinking more like uh, tasty works, you know, kind of like uh, uh, well, trading small, you know, Tom Sosnoff kind of trading small and often. Maybe, I don't know if that's the toss view or Tom's view, but anyway, yeah. Okay. Tom's yeah. Tom Sosnoff. Um, uh, yeah. It's like, I, I think the Tom view of, of, of trading small, I think I a hundred percent agree with that. Uh, I think that especially for a brand new trader, trading small is critical. Um, you, but I think even probably more important with, or just as important as trading small is also whatever trades that you're doing that have you back tested and have you learned how to be able to perform your trades in all kinds of markets. And I, I, I preach this to all of my students in the sense of going back 
you know, many, many, many years, you know, maybe even to the tune of back to, you know, 2011 or so, and whatever trade you're doing, and I don't care if it's, you know, M3, you know, road trip, uh, you know, bearish butterfly, rock trade, uh, you know, uh, super fly or all the various fruit flies or whatever kind of trades are out there, you know, Kevlar, you know, all the various trades that are out there. I, I don't care what it is. If you've gone through and actually walked through, you know, that many years worth of backtesting and you've actually, you know, learned how to handle those trades in various markets, that's where you're going to get your education. I don't care what strategy it is. You're going to learn how to handle because why, why, and I think that's, you know, Tom's view of trading small and often. Um, I, I don't do what he does because I don't have the, um, you know, the, the wherewithal of the market information that he tends to, I think, uh, trade with. Um, I try to put more of my time and energy into just kind of managing trades versus trying to, pick a trade that I think is just going to do well. Um, I put my trades on and, you know, 90% of the time it's, you know, usually like some sort of a, a butterfly or broken wing butterfly. And um, that's, that's how I do it. I think over time, as your, as your situation improves, as far as your profitability, you can increase your, you know, your trade size. Um, as long as you are keeping your your risk under control and you're keeping, you know, you may end up as your size increases starting to, you may take on, you may uh, create some hedges. And I think, Tim, you talk about this in some of your, you know, sessions where, you know, regardless, you know, you are doing some hedging to, you know, take care of, of uh, maybe a, you know, black swan type of event or just a, just a, just a downturn in the market. I know I've, I've talked to John Locke about that particular thing, and I think um, he does uh, possibly some of that, but I think more importantly, he tends to always use some of his profits to kind of create a, you know, an insurance account per se. In other words, putting money into an account that, you know, in case of a really uh, bad situation, you have an account there that you can basically go to after a while that you can actually go and use for your trading. Uh, so it's more of, building up an, a, like an insurance account um, using some of your earnings. Um, and it's kind of a more of a kind of a uh, proactive way or an offensive way to be able to deal with the potential uh, downturns in market versus I would say a completely defensive way of just adding hedges or, you know, buying puts or something. So, yeah. Well, I, um, <clears throat> uh, to answer Kevin's question from my point of view, um, you know, you can, you can do like one large trade a month or you can do several smaller trades a month and try to make the same amount uh, to different strategies. Um, depends on partly on if you can handle that, you know, <laughs> it's your bandwidth. And if, if what you're doing, if you're doing multiple trades is safe enough that they don't all go bad at the same time, cause I'm going to tell you, you have a lot of trades on and they all go bad at the same time and the market's dropping like crazy, you're going to be pretty frazzled. You're going to be pretty, pretty bent out of shape from that. And that's one problem with trading multiple trades. Um, I do trade multiple trades, but they're time diversified and they are um, able to handle a fair, a pretty fair sized market move without too much trouble. And uh, because of that and because of how I manage them, I guess I can, I can handle it, you know? <laughs> so it's a philosophy and it's, 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 it's up to your capability if you can, if you can do that and you want to, um, but those are two different ways of making money. Hey Tim, I know you're asking me uh, the other thing, maybe just, I think we've almost hit all of the things. Uh, uh, maybe just, we can just in the last couple of minutes here, um, we've got end of the year planning, which I think we're, uh, that is, I think was kind of just a, a kind of a quick subject to saying that, you know, if, if people, <clears throat> because of tax reasons, you know, they like to either be, some people like to be completely out of the market. So they don't have any kind of carryover trades from one uh, tax year to the next tax year. So some people like to get out. Some people just kind of keep, keep, keep on going right ahead. And they usually just have maybe a little bit more uh, detail to work out with their, uh, <laughs> with their tax return for the next year or, or work with or, or more work for their CPA potentially. Um, 
but I think that's just maybe just a quick comment on that. I don't know if you have any more to add to that because the other thing was I can actually pop up a, uh, a screen, Tim, of the M or just the results for the year. We, maybe we can just end on that or something. Yeah, um, sure. Um, well, I don't worry about end of year, and so I'll go through the end of the year and I'll let the CPA figure it out. That's that's what I do. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, and if you're just trading indexes, you don't have to worry about wash sales. And so, um, I don't know, that's just me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Can you see my screen here, uh, Tim? I do. Let's yep. see. I see yeah. it. Okay, so this is uh, something that actually I just um, 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 I just got actually from uh, John Locke this morning. This is just his uh, end of the year uh, kind of look at his trades here. I'm trying to get this all on one screen, but I can't seem to do it. Um, but basically his M3 trade, which is right here, um, if you were to do it with, um, I guess it doesn't have the December trades in here yet, um, but basically it's he's had a like, you can, He's got the bearish butterfly M3 rock trade and this V trade he stopped doing this year. But if you just take a look at these top three, uh, they did, you know, they were very good uh, returns for the year. Now, just to, to note, uh, the two top trades, the bearish butterfly and M3, those returns are actually about twice what you would normally think about because um, they, um, they would be multiple trades on at the same time. So if you had to keep your capital all at the, the same level, you would actually cut those in half. And I think he has these in this next column out here. Yeah, so you can see 100, it's actually 67% for the bearish butterfly, 47% for the M3 and 80% for the uh, rock trade because that is a, just a 30 day trade. So uh, I think some people were looking to see, you know, what those results were for the year. Uh, I think that the, uh, just to note, is that this is obviously, these are the website trades that John does that he has his kind of Monday morning thing that uh, at least I listen to every Monday um, that he kind of goes over the, the basics for these trades. Um, and the, um, but to note is that, you know, these trades typically will probably, you know, compared to the, I'll say the, the average beginner, he will, John will probably take these things a little bit probably closer to expiration than probably most people would. So that would probably have an effect on some of these returns for sure. Um, so, but, but these are pretty much by the, by the book. Uh, they're absolutely, you know, just by the, the rules or guidelines that he puts out for those. Uh, the only thing, the caveat that I would throw in there is that, um, uh, you know, he, John tends to take these things a little bit closer to expiration than, um, than, than certainly I do as, uh, as practice. Uh, but that's just because I'm a, a quite a bit more conservative than John in, 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 uh, in the trading. So, um, so I don't know if people have any questions about those. I guess the only other one is just the, I'll just throw up here is a uh, UB1 trade, which is another trade that I do. And that one was, right around 24, 25% for, for the year, about 10 wins, one loss of which is, which is actually very close to exactly uh, my own personal situation. So, um, and this is just a, you know, a, a broken wing uh, butterfly. So um, I don't know, that was, uh, uh, I'm glad to thank John for sending that to me early this morning. <laughs> so I could share that with everybody. Well, that popped off some questions, Dave. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Well, we got one minute, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can go a couple I, I, extra. We don't have to end exactly in an hour. Yeah, I don't. I'm I'm not seeing the questions, so I don't. Know. They were on my screen before, and now they kind of disappeared. So I'm not sure where they are. Tom, do you see? Uh, I don't know how to get the questions here. I think if you go up to the top, there's like yeah. the thing with a couple of dots and then there's a thing with the chat. Oh, they're very nice. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Uh, these, I don't know where we, okay. What percentage of profit would you accept for commissions? Uh, Tim, I, I have no idea how to answer that. Well, I, I know how I'd answer that. Um, it's, it's, you're asking the question in the wrong way. Commissions happen, okay, and they're necessary. And um, I don't think about percentage of profit for commissions. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That to, to me, I just try to get the lowest commissions I can get. You can negotiate them, and if you can, you should get as low as you can get. And other than that, commissions happen. So, um, what percent does it turn out to be? It, it, it's sometimes ten percent of of the profit you thought you were going to make. Hopefully, usually it's less than that, three or four percent. But uh, that's I think where it comes out to be. Yeah, the question on on slippage. Uh, yes, th th these are assuming no slippage because these are just these aren't negotiated. These are actual websites when John goes and makes a trade he just puts it in and hits convert trade and that's what you get so yes you're absolutely correct so these all could be um, uh, so yeah there is no slippage in these and Kevin asks, uh, these are his live trades no these are website trades uh, so th these are ones that he does you know to show people on the website his his uh, trades and uh, so they are they're um, how do you say that, Tim? They're they're live, but they're not they're not negotiated. They're actually just. Um... Well, Kush says they're not live. They're simulated, and they assume no slippage. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess that's correct. Yeah, I mean they're uh, so, so they're, they're okay. Yeah, I mean the, he, John is going and doing trades, and he'll usually say at you know at thirty minutes before the end of the day he does he does his he does his. Um, uh, adjustments and that's when he'll do it he'll put the trade in convert it and that's what it is so yeah. that's that's where it, that, that's you know I think as clear as we can be so um, Alex B says do you do the bearish fly trade uh, every month uh, well John certainly I don't know if you mean me personally or or John does it he does it here yes he, he does it every month as far as the website trade uh, I don't do it every month but John does it as far as the uh, the website trade here and I think Neil asks, are those returns based on mass, max risk per trade or for the total account? Those uh, those are, I can show it right up here. Um, these are based upon a $50,000 allocation for each trade, the bearish butterfly, M3, and rock trade. They're all assuming a $50,000 plan capital. You know, so in other words, he'll never go over that size. Oops. I hit the wrong button, Tom. <laughs> no problem. I was trying to look at more questions and I hit the wrong button. So. Like a a... I'm not sure what's being shared at this point. Uh, nothing. Oh. Nothing. Oh. Okay. Whose screen is up there, Tom? Uh, I just see like the normal event information. I don't see anybody sharing. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we're probably any any other last minute questions, Tom? Or uh, I think he covered them pretty well. Um... Okay, yeah, Alex B. All right, yeah, I think we got it. So uh, it's a little over an hour, so this is a, probably a good place to stop. So okay. appreciate both of you coming on. Uh, say hi to John. It's been a while since we talked, but uh, he's always welcome we'll back too. Sure, sure. Hopefully, uh, hopefully people will you know take some of the things that Tim and I talk about as a as a information to kind of you know help themselves out a little bit. And uh, you know, like I said, if you're ever uh, uh, out in the Seattle area, not only you, Tom, but also anybody in the trading world. And, you know, um, you know, Tim and I are always meeting with people out here and stuff like that. So we'd always be uh, interested to, uh, you know, meet up with people. And uh, if you care to venture out into the, into the, into the beautiful Northwest here. <laughs> oh, sure. And uh, if you like, if you send me that spreadsheet, I can post it with the recording so people can take a look at the results. Cause I think the might have some requests for that. Sure. Sure. We'll do. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. And I uh, hope everybody has a good holiday season. If you celebrate Christmas, I hope that goes well for you. And if you're traveling, that you do that in safety as well. And uh, I think that'll be our, our last meeting for the year. We're not going to have one next week. So we'll see you all next year. And again, thanks, uh, Dave and Tim. Uh, it's always fun to get together. Great, great. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks so much for inviting and inviting us on. And uh, like I said, it's a, a very uh, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody out there. And uh, um, you know, hopefully, have a, a great year, uh, a, a great year uh, of uh, 2018 for for all you traders as well. 
you bet. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.